us. And so this morning, actually, we approach the last chapter of our book of Philippians, our letter to the Philippians authored by the Apostle Paul. The English Standard Version in chapter 4 is where we're going to be this morning. The English Standard Version, unlike the King James and the New American Standard Version, places the opening of verse 4, or verse 1 of chapter 4, in such a place as it might suggest. If that's what you have in your lap right now, you might want to look down at it. It places the opening of this verse actually closer to chapter 3. Um, almost as if it fits better as a closing to chapter 3, three than what he is about to write, what Paul is about to write in chapter 4. Now, you have to remember, I'm not telling you something that you don't already know, that in the Greek text, there are no chapter and verse divisions. And they were added later. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, it was the Geneva Bible, who had the first translation of the Geneva Bible, who gave us the chapter and verse delineations that we have now in our modern English translations. So the translators have a duty or responsibility before them to tie these things together in thoughts and in context of things that the author is saying. So we must admit it does seem, if you read it, we're going to read it in just a minute, to fit quite nicely with what Paul has already written in chapter 3, but we'll stick with how the translators have put it in our Bibles. So look with me this morning at chapter 4. I'm going to read only verses 1 through 3 because that's all that I will have time this morning to address. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Sintiki to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, it should be noted that in this new and final chapter, Paul continues with yet even more exhortations. This is not uncommon to Paul's writings. You know, after having read his epistles, that oftentimes as he's closing a letter, he will begin in almost a chain of exhortations and oftentimes closing by acknowledging certain individuals who have been influential either most often positively and even occasionally negatively in his ministry and in the authorship of that particular letter. So Philippians is not strange or off tenor with Paul in that it closes with exhortations. So while they are in some way new exhortations, what he writes stands on what he has already written. In fact, Paul's use of the Greek word translated therefore in our English text signifies the continuation of thought. And in this particular case, it also marks Paul's movement toward a close of the epistle. Because sometimes that word is positioned midway in an epistle or at the beginning of a paragraph when he's not near the closing of the letter. But here it is actually marked. It is actually marking the beginning of the close. In fact, Kitchen in his exegetical commentary on this epistle refers to the opening word or this opening word as the continuation slash transition word. And this likely explains the ESV's placement of this verse in a seemingly isolated sense. It's placed right above the subtitle that you're given in your English Standard Version Bible for this particular text of Scripture. So it marks a transition and at the same time a continuation. So verse 1 is rich and certainly warrants our attention. Again, look at it with me as I read it to you one more time and note some particular things. Therefore, my brothers, 
whom I love. Now notice these things that Paul says here. Whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. After the transition, we see Paul use for the fifth of seven times the Greek word adelphoi in the text that we have here translated or interpreted brothers or brethren in the King James of the New American Standard Bible. And as I repeatedly said to you, as I've gone through not only this epistle, but others that we've been through during our exposition, this is not merely a casual use of a familial word. In fact, since doing New Testament studies pretty seriously over the last several decades, the use of the word brother to me has become more of a, of a significant thing. I used to, in fact, many of us do it today. We'll just randomly meet somebody on the street and we'll address them as what? Hey, brother. And we just throw that word out there like it. And in one, I understand this, what we're doing. In fact, in one way, are we not all human beings and therefore we are brothers or we are sisters of the human race? We share that commonality. But when I think of what it means spiritually, it, it goes far beyond that. It's not just merely a casual word we use for familial relationships. It's rather a rich, significant word in spiritual connotation. It is a term of endearment, specifically Paul's choice of a word when it comes to endearment when addressing fellow Christians. Now granted, in other places Paul uses the word to speak of his kinship in the flesh with fellow Jews, but when he uses it in the context of fellow believers in Christ, it becomes a far more meaningful word. Just as brothers in the flesh are biologically and genetically family, brothers in Christ are spiritually family, or spiritually family by virtue of their being joined to Christ. I found it interesting when I thought about this to note that Christ himself, in fact, we're told in Hebrews 2.11 that Christ himself is not ashamed to call us brothers. Now think about that. Because we all have one father, that is, all that have been made His are of the same family. We have with Christ God as our Father. And I was thinking, even as I was contemplating this this morning before stepping up here, as I think about our Lord's high priestly prayer in John 17, where He addresses the Father in the way that Jesus communicated intimately with Abba, Father. In reality, that which Jesus has a right to refer to His Father as Abba we too have been granted that same privilege by the Spirit because we too, by the Spirit, cry what? Abba, Father. And so not only do we share God as our Father, as Christians, we share a familial relationship spiritually with one another. As I said to you last Sunday, I remember saying this, that transcends even, in many cases, our biological and genetic relationship. The, the camaraderie, the fellowship, the relationship that we enjoy with fellow Christians sometimes transcends that which we have even with our normal family. It doesn't, that it, it doesn't mean that it minimizes our love for our biological family, but we have to understand that our lives are going to be spent with our biological families if they are unbelievers only in this life. And yet our lives will be spent with our brothers and sisters in Christ for all of eternity. And what a wonderful thought that is to consider. So this same sense of endearment that Paul uses when he calls them brothers or, or brethren is reinforced by what he writes next in this verse. And that's why I had you look at these particular words. He says next, brothers whom I love and long for. Now that phrase, whom I love, agape toi is the word in the Greek. It literally can be translated, should be translated beloved. It is the form of the richest and deepest and strongest Greek word that we have in the New Testament for love, which we know as agape. We cannot forget how Paul opened this epistle back in chapter one. In fact, look back there with me for a moment. <clears throat> 
in chapter 1. And look at verses 3 through 9. Do not forget how he opened it. And as he's coming to a close, he reinforces, in essence, how he opened it. He says here in verse 3 of chapter 1, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you. Now look at what he says here. I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What, what do we see there? The expressions of love that Paul gives us there. The expressions of love are given in the following. Listen to these as you look back with me again through that part of chapter 1. Paul's remembrance of them. Paul's remembrance of them. Secondly, Paul's prayers for them. Thirdly, Paul tells us he holds them in his heart. Fourthly, Paul's yearning for them with all the affection of Christ Jesus. Now, if you stop and think about those four things, these are pretty explicit expressions of the deep love Paul truly possessed toward these believers. Think about if you were to receive a letter from someone that you deemed close to you or an intimate friend or family, whatever it might be, and those were the very things that made up the content of that letter, that they let you know that they were in remembrance of you, that they were praying for you, that they were holding you fast in their heart, and they yearned to see you. You would pause after reading something like that, what would you say? Wow, they, they really love me. I mean, this is real, genuine love. And that is exactly what Paul is trying to communicate to his readers. Think of it like this way. This, Paul actually equates his love for them as being an expression of Christ's love, his affection for them, which is no, no small thing if you think about it. In fact, Paul is in fact saying, with the same affection that Christ has for you, I also share that affection. But he doesn't stop there. He tells them, and long for you. The Greek adjective captures a verbal concept leading some translators, especially the New American Standard, to add the verb. If you've got a New American Standard Bible with you, you'll see the words to see are in italics in your Bible because the translators have added that to give the full meaning and expression of what Paul is saying. I and long for or I long to see you. The adjective form of the word is used only one time in the entire New Testament, and here it is. And it clearly designates those who are very dear, those for whom there is a deep longing. Paul not only says, I love you, I pray for you, but I yearn, I long for your presence. And as if these two expressions were not sufficient enough to communicate how Paul felt toward his readers, he adds two more, even richer, deeper expressions. Now, pause for a moment before I go any further. Why, why, am, I driving, why am I driving these points home? Because this is saying something to us. What this is expressing, the intention of this, is to express to us the importance as believers of our love for one another. How much we are to truly love one another. 
as if these two were not enough. Listen to what he says next. He says, my joy and crown. He refers to these believers as his joy and as his crown. This is not the only place where Paul uses this expression. In fact, if you were to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, Paul expresses his longing to see his dear Thessalonian brothers as well. And he writes to them in verse 19 and following, For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord at His coming? Is it not you? Is it not you? And then in verse 20, he continues, For you are our glory and joy. Paul's speaking to believers. Paul's reference to joy, kara in the Greek, which we also derive our word grace from, here should come of no, to us of no surprise. It's been the overarching theme of this whole epistle. Here, it particularly speaks to the Philippian being, Philippians being good reason for Paul to celebrate. They had given Paul cause to celebrate. And this is especially rich when you think of where Paul was at the time of his writing. Where was he, church? He was in prison. And yet he writes to them, you, I love you, I, I long for you, you are my glory, you are my crown, you are my very reason for celebration, regardless of where I am when I think of you, I rejoice. You give me cause to rejoice. Paul adds, not only is he, is he their cause, are they his cause for rejoicing, but he adds the word crown, which is interesting that he uses this here in context. That is the Greek word Stephanos. Does it sound familiar? We get our word Stephen, and we get our word Stephanie from. In fact, that's one of the reasons why Stephanie has the name that she has. We chose that name. The Greek word Stephanos are meaning crown, and here's the reason why. In, in the noun form, it is designated as a, a laurel wreath. Think of a wreath put on someone's head of the victor in the athletic games. Now, literally, the word Stephanos means surrounding. And so when you think of a laurel wreath that is placed on someone's head like a crown, you think of that which surrounds their head is placed on their head. It was also used to designate that which one may receive in honor by their peers, something like what we might give today in a trophy. So it, is, it actually can be seen as not merely just a wreath put on someone's head, it can be seen literally as a crown or as a trophy. The latter designation seems to fit well with the context of Paul's writing. For certainly, if you think about it, the Philippian believers were not only Paul's calls for celebration, but also, in a true sense, they were his trophy. Paul saw those who he had been responsible for sharing the gospel with and bringing to faith. Paul saw them, in a true sense, as his trophy as his trophies. I'm reminded as I think about this back in Corinthians. Paul brought, obviously, the gospel to Corinth. He preached the gospel there. He wrote at least two, we know two letters, possibly three letters to the Corinthians. Two of them are canonized in our scriptures. And so he had a close relationship with them. And yet certain teachers had come in to even Corinth and uh, had kind of tried to undermine the apostolic authority of Paul even questioning Paul's authority by saying, by whom, whose letters do you receive Paul? In other words, whose letter of acceptance did Paul bring to you when he first came to you? And Paul responds by saying, letters, really? I need letters of entrance into your company. Let me remind you, dear Corinthians, that you and you alone are my letters. You are the reason. Your, your reason for being in Christ was that I brought 
the gospel to you. He treasured deeply those with whom he had that kind of relationship with, even deeming them as his glory or of his trophies. We are, in fact, living epistles. Paul refers to his Corinthian brothers that way. So this, he is their, they are his honor. They are his glory. They are his trophy. Their devotion to Christ and the gospel, their continual faith and obedience were a tangible expression of the effectiveness of Paul's ministry. The Philippians were Paul's present joy, reason for celebration, and his trophy as well. Think about this for just a moment. Think about it. Paul's joy, Paul's reward in a sense, was the knowledge that those who brought, he brought the gospel to were faithful and obedient. If someone were to ask me pastorally, I'm thinking about this, if someone were to ask me pastorally, Pastor Mitch, how is it that by what measure or by what standard would you determine the success of your ministry? Would it be by the number of people that attend your church every Sunday? Would it be the amount of the budget every year? Would it be, and I could go into a litany of things that some might regard as signs of success in ministry. I, I would say, while I don't dismiss those things completely, I would say those things pale in comparison to what really matters in regards to determining whether a ministry is successful. The, a ministry is successful, can truly be deemed successful when those who are sitting under that ministry are genuinely being taught the true gospel and are growing in their faith in Christ and their obedience to the gospel that they are hearing. To me, that's the measure of truest success. It would be that the people that I stand before every week and preach the gospel to walk out the door further knowledgeable of the things pertaining to the gospel, closer in their relationship with God, and continually remaining obedient to the gospel that they are receiving and are hearing. That is the reward. And that is the trophy of successful ministry. Some men do what they do for a lot of reasons. I just expressed some of those to you. Some for the approval and accolades of men. They love seeing their name out somewhere or wherever it might be. Others for the temporal and material or even immediate rewards of notoriety. But I tell you, these pale, as I said just a moment ago, they pale in comparison with, in fact, they are worthless in light of the reward of hearing the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. Being found faithful, as Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 25 and 28. He says, according to the stewardship from God that was given to us to make the word of God fully known, presenting everyone mature in Christ. That's the trophy. In his last epistle, the second epistle to Timothy, Paul, in that, in that epistle, writes these words. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And listen to what he says next. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the Stephanos, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and listen to what he says, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul had his priorities in place. Paul's greatest honor, his greatest reward, his crown, his trophy, in a real sense, would be to see the day when Christ returns and accompanying Christ would be all the precious saints that he had shared the gospel with. I can't think of anything any sweeter than that thought. 
that that day when Christ appears, those who I had the privilege of bringing the gospel to will appear with him in all of his glory. This should be every pastor's goal. It's seen as his crown as well, not the size, not the beauty of his building, not the size of his congregation, nor the size of his budget, but the careful growth spiritually of those God has entrusted to his care and set him over as a steward. And with these wonderfully encouraging things Paul has written, Paul immediately follows with what amounts to be a sobering exhortation. In fact, I really think as I read this, that while Paul absolutely meant completely what he had just written in chapter 1, that he actually is also using that commendation in a way to kind of cushion what he's going to do next. It's like, okay, I'm going to tell you how I really feel about you, my expression of love for you, because... I have something I've got to deal with, something that I have to address. But he continues, he says, with the wonderfully encouraging things, Paul immediately follows with what amounts to be a sobering exhortation. He says, actually, this exhortation is a command. He says, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Stand firm. Stichete in the Greek is in the present imperative, which calls for an ongoing, continuous action. It's not a suggestion. It's not Paul saying, if you think of it or if you feel like it, it is a continuous action verb. In fact, Kitchen comments, quote, it is a call to be firmly committed in conviction or belief, end of quote. How might such an imperative be carried out? That's a great question. In fact, this question opens for us the clear association of what Paul says in this verse, commanding them to stand firm with what he is about to say in the verse following. Perhaps this is the very reason the translation opened chapter 4 with this verse. Paul softens it a bit before going into something that he needs to deal with in the next verse. And the key is, he says, be Stand, he says, stand fast or stand firm thus. And the key is in that word translated thus in the English Standard Version or stand firm in this way in the New American Standard. In verse 2, Paul begins to give his readers a series of exhortations that contain principles that are important to standing firm. They are the the thus of verse 1 or the way. And look at how he applies stand first. Stand firm first. In verse 2, he says this. He says, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Pause for a moment here. If you pause and consider this verse in the context of Paul's earlier approach of graciousness and gentleness, it displays a stark abruptness on the part of the apostle. In this letter, if you think about this, and I've mentioned this as we've gone through the exposition, unlike many of Paul's other epistles where he is dealing with doctrinal error, especially Galatians where he is not only dealing with error, but he is dealing with believers who have almost intentionally embraced error and are walking in in lies rather than walking in the truth, where in the whole letter of Galatians you find no commendation at all. This letter has been nothing but one commendation right after the other, even the opening of this verse. And so now in almost a stark abruptness, Paul transitions almost for the first time to deal with something that may be going on, in fact, is going on inside the church. He names names. Paul actually Calls names. Now, I, I thought about this pastorally, how this must be to actually call names. Now, Paul is not literally there. This letter is likely being read to them by Epaphroditus. He's probably, he's the one who's delivered the letter. He's reading it. And if he's not reading, he's giving it to the lead elder and they're reading it. And all of a sudden, picture yourself pastorally or as an elder of a church, 
You've received the letter from the apostle, and you've been told to read this letter to the, to the church, and all of a sudden you get to this point, and your eyes venture down on the scroll that you're reading, and there in bold print are two names. And you are about to call them out in regard to something that is going on between them. There is a problem. In fact, in fact, Paul doesn't, by calling their names, kind of skip over or speak in generalities, which is the way that we normally like to do things. Certainly the church itself is aware of the problem that's going on, so there's no need for Paul to tiptoe through the tulips, and he doesn't do that anyway. And here's the problem. There is a problem between two women in the church. Now, I want, to, I want to tell you, I don't want to make this at all because it's really not. This is not a sexist issue. Some might say, well, there he is again. There is Paul again. Paul liked to pick on women. No, that's absolutely not true. In fact, the argument that's even being made to this day that Paul had a low impression or low view or perspective on women is absolutely not true. In fact, you need only read the closing of his epistles with the commendations that he gives in regards to many women that he not only regards highly, but credits greatly for the success of the gospel in the particular places that he has been ministering. You will remember in context, who was it in Philippi that received the gospel first? It was a woman. Paul preached the gospel first to her. So regardless of the reality that Paul is addressing two women in this context, this could very well be in any church setting, not only two women, but also could be two men. So don't get caught up on the idea that Paul is simply going after women. Paul is going after a principle here, and I want you to see the principle that he's going after. What matters to Paul in this epistle besides the overarching theme of joy we have seen in the whole, t whole thing has been another overarching theme of unity and harmony in the church. And this particular situation possesses the potential of disrupting and breaking the harmony that is existing in the Philippian church between these precious believers. Now, in the Old, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, Names mean something. I mean, I, I, I've seen someone's name. I, I think one of, the, one of the great Christian commentators of the Puritan era's name was Ichabod. And I'm wondering, why would you ever name your son Ichabod? Maybe his mom was having a bad day when he was born. I don't know what the situation was. And I've looked at other names that pe uh, people have named their sons and named their daughters. But names are significant. In fact, I love to look at the meanings of names. And if you look at the Greek words, those names are the Greek that those names consist of, you learn a lot. In fact, Euodia and Syntyche were pretty common first century feminine Roman names. So there's nothing unique about the names until you look at what their names mean. Euodia means prosperous journey. A prosperous journey. Sintiki means pleasant acquaintance or good luck. And this is the only place in all of the scripture that these two ladies are mentioned in the New Testament. But think about this. Their names are forever etched in eternity because they are mentioned in the canon of Holy Scripture. And Paul's opening to this verse is strong. He says, I entreat or I urge you. It implies a pleading. It is almost indicative of someone who is begging someone of something. The English, the, uh, New, the uh, King James Version translates it beseech, a word that we don't use in our English anymore, but we do know the meaning of it. If someone comes to us and says, I beseech you, we understand they're doing what? They're pleading with us. They are, in a sense, begging us in regards to something. Is that what Paul is doing? Paul is saying, I beg you. I'm, I'm pleading with you. I urge you. I entrust you. And it's safe to assume that these two women were at odds with each other. Over a matter, Paul doesn't name except to say 
to agree in the Lord. Now, some commentators have attempted to argue that perhaps their disagreement was over a doctrinal issue, and that hence explains why Paul said, agree in the Lord. Maybe they were debating doctrine among them, so I'm not so sure there's any particular reason to believe that. I can tell you this, if it was important enough for us to know, the Holy Spirit would have given it to us. What is important enough to know is that whether this was trivial, menial, or of a greater significance than that, it stood in a particular place to bring this harmony and this unity to the body of believers. There was some sort of disagreement, either in, in full swing or in the beginning stages. Paul had gotten wind of it, and Paul wants to deal with it. He could be dealing with a couple a problem already affecting the Philippian fellowship or perhaps heading off in further, a further disintegration of the relationship between two sisters that could have a profound effect, negative effect on the church. Isn't it amazing that when there is a beef, and I use that word because it's a word we often use today, when there's a beef between parties, when there's a bone of contention, which is another expression that we often use, or there's disagreement between sometimes even two parties in a fellowship, even a large fellowship, it never remains private, does it? Rarely ever will it remain private. It's kind of like leaven that moves subtly through the whole loaf until the whole loaf begins to rise. A little leaven, the scripture tells us, leavens an awful lot. And Paul is keenly aware of that. He is keenly aware of the danger of disharmony and division in the church. And listen to this because this is the principle. One of the principles Paul is trying to bring home here. Disharmony and division will rob a church of its spiritual effectiveness. It will rob a church of its spiritual effectiveness. Disharmony and division, even in the seemingly most insignificant ways. In fact, as the Old Testament writer says, it is the small foxes that spoil the vines. They, they're the things that are, are least obvious until they've done the most damage. It's just always eating away in a small way until suddenly they become, it's almost, I look at like we can understand this in our context of living in Florida and our use of St. Augustine grass. When your grass dies and dries up and all you see are the strings that used to have the beautiful green on it and your lawn guy comes and says, oh, that's chinch bugs. It's already what? It's already too late. You're not going to kill them and bring deadness back to life. You're going to have to dig that up and start all over again. So that which you couldn't even see, you may have slowly and initially begin to see the consequences of it, but by the time you, you saw the real result of it, it was too late to do anything about it. And that is exactly what happens when there is disharmony and disunity in a church, even among a very small group, or even in this case, among a couple, that the spiritual, the spiritual effectiveness of the church can be threatened. Listen, church. And I'm glad that we do this expo expositionally, because whenever you deal with a text, like, can you imagine me just coming in this morning and picking Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3 to preach on? What would everybody be walking out of here wondering, okay, what's going on that we don't know about? What's going on that we don't know about? What's, what's the pastor dealing with? Is this his way of addressing it? No. The beautiful thing is we just go verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, boom, there we go through them, and there they are. And I have to trust that whenever we are at any given place in the Scripture, that the Spirit of God will use it for our edification and for encouraging and for strengthening us. But listen, church, we cannot, absolutely cannot, wage an effective fight against the enemies of the cross of Christ if we are fighting among ourselves. 
I can tell you that pastorally we deal with a lot of things. We deal with people who sometimes begin, they believe things that are not right and you have to try to bring them off of what they're believing that's not wrong and bring them to an understanding of the truth of what is right. And that's, that's one thing that we do. And yet sometimes you deal with the more serious things like this where you've got those parties in a particular church that are not agreeing with one another, that are contentious with one another for whatever reason. That, to me, is the most frustrating thing. Correcting false doctrine is one thing, but when you've got two, and these, these dear ladies were examples of this, when you have two dear, precious saints who are finding it to dif- difficult to get along with each other, that, that's something of very significance. But we cannot wage effective fight against the enemies of the cross if we're truly fighting among ourselves. Some may, wrongly I might add, suggest perhaps some things are left better alone. Some might would say, well, Paul might have been better off if he'd have just simply left that alone. In fact, that's, we call that proverbially what? Sweeping it under the rug. The only problem with sweeping things under the rug is that eventually the rug becomes so lumpy (laughs) that somebody is inevitably going to trip on it. You just simply cannot do that. Now, we know that some things of minor natures can often be dealt with privately, and that's how the majority of things, in my estimation, should be dealt with. I I think Matthew 18 gives us a very clear delineation of how we should deal with situations. If there is a disagreement between two parties, then they should go to each other, and they should work those things out. And if they cannot work those things out among themselves, then they bring someone in as a third party to try to help them work those things out. Ultimately, that is where it will end, that there'll be reconciliation and restoration. Brothers and sisters will be restored to each other. The church will remain strong in its effective witness for the gospel. That's the way it should go. Sadly, sometimes it's not like that. In the areas of church discipline, issues have to be addressed openly. This wasn't necessarily a situation of church discipline, but it was a situation where Paul deemed it necessary to address it by calling out those who were guilty of it. However, it serves, and Paul uses it as a clear example of how even the seemingly mundane things can become something that breaks the harmony and fellowship of believers. A church, and therefore should be addressed. Remember, I've told you as I've gone through this exposition that in one of the commentaries that I use by, by John Kitchen, he has in little blocks the, what he calls ministry maxims. And I've enjoyed reading those, and I've said it to you many times. But on this particular page of commentary, he writes this maxim. He says, quote, personal conflict has corporate consequences, end of quote. And I can tell you firsthand, pastorally, this is an absolute truth. Sadly, often personal schisms spill over into the fellowship, and before you know it, the harmony of the church is at risk. Even in a church like the one in Philippi, I might even cautiously, cautiously, say, even in a church like we enjoy here at Crosswalk, where they, we do enjoy harmony and unity, where, where there is an obedience to the faith of the gospel. Listen, and do not be oblivious to the reality that there is always the potential threat, the danger of disharmony. No church is immune. And so we are to guard ourselves. In fact, when we consider others more significant, as Paul says, than ourselves, I think that is one of the greatest deterrents uh, 
to disharmony and disunity is if we are preferring others over ourselves. Where does disharmony and disunity gen generally begin? When somehow I feel like my personal rights have somehow been imposed on improperly. It becomes all about what? It becomes all about me. Rather than letting it go and preferring others over myself for the sake of unity. And if it is something that is not that something that can be lightly dismissed or pushed aside, then there is a proper context in, in which to address it, but never is the context to let it fester to the point that it's, it moves to the body, as I said a moment ago, bringing disharmony and disunity. And in this context of these two women, Paul entreats them to work out their differences. In fact, he says, agree in the Lord. It was as if, if you're reading it like this, Paul is there, and I can see him during this time focusing his attention to these two women. Now, likely they're not sitting together. One's probably sitting over here, and one's probably sitting way over there. And I can see the apostle. Now, I can imagine that whoever it is reading this letter, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, is probably thinking, I'm not going to look up at anybody. <laughs> Even though I have the names, I'm not going to. But if Paul was there, Paul would have looked and he said, I entreat you, Euodia and Syntyche. Looking directly at them, I entreat you, I beseech you, two precious sisters in Christ, agree in the Lord. Come together. Work out your differences. Because it matters. It not only matters to you, but it matters to the health and the life of the church. And it matters as a matter of our witness to a community out there that does not know Christ. For when the church is experiencing that kind of disharmony and that kind of unity, we only give our adversaries the ammunition they are longing for to do what? To bring accusation upon us. Look at those people. They claim to love everybody and they can't even love each other. No. No, he doesn't say that they didn't love each other. In fact, I would, I would I venture to say that if these two sisters were called out and brought publicly before the church, they would look at each other and say, yes, sister, I do love you. Yes, sister, I do love you. But Paul doesn't tell them to love each other. Paul tells them to do what? To agree. To agree with one another. Put their differences aside and agree in the Lord. Whatever is causing the disharmony, even if it is a matter of clashing personalities, if it's a matter of doctrine, if it's a matter of whatever it may be, resolve it. Get it out of the way and come back together. However, as I bring this to a close with this said, Paul knew true resolution to the issue was likely beyond what these two women would be able to do alone. Now look at what he says in verse 3. He says, yes, I ask you also. Now notice that word, those two words, true companion. Interesting, could be a potential play on words, but notice this. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. It's pretty clear. Paul is keenly aware that their, a resolution or reconciliation to their disagreement may require a third party. May require some help. So Paul solicits the help of someone in the church. It's amazing as I read through the different commentaries, the different views and perspectives on who this might be. In fact, commentators and scholars differ and who Paul might be addressing when he says, I ask you also, true companion. Some believe it to be a particular individual. For example, some said, well, it could be Silas, who had a close relationship with the church. It could be Epaphroditus, who brought the letter back. It could be him, who the church loved, who likely was an elder in the church, or at least a leader in the church. 
It could be the lead elder. It could be the lead pastor at that particular time, the person that's reading it. Or maybe there is an elder in the group in the church that will know by virtue of Paul's use of the word that this is him. And that he's the one that Paul is soliciting. Some say, well, it's a general term for the church, that the church should come together as a whole and help him. I tend to believe that Paul is addressing a particular individual person in the church, and he chooses to leave unnamed offering, referring to them only as true companion. And yet, interestingly, the Greek word for true companion itself might be a play on words because the word used there for companion actually was a Greek word used as a proper name for a man. So whether he is speaking to someone who he considers to have been a close true companion of his or whether he's actually calling this person by name, I believe it is, it is fair to say Paul is speaking to an individual. And when, when the reader would read it, true companion the church would readily know who this individual was that Paul was referring to. In fact, the individual himself would know who, it, who he was. Now, this is Paul speaking to me. In fact, the noun is in the masculine, so it's safe to believe that Paul means a male in the congregation. Paul is saying, oh, you who are my true companion, you're the one... I want you to come alongside these two women and I want you to help them resolve their problem. Now, if you think of it in the context of New Testament church leadership, who might that be? It could very well be the pastor. It could very well be another elder in the congregation. But somebody's going to, be, going to have to come up beside these ladies and help him. And Paul goes on to tell us these two women at one time did work together in harmony. In fact, they, along with a man by the name of Clement, labored side by side with Paul for the gospel. This is what Paul is saying. You, Euodia and Syntyche, you and Clement were together with me. We were together in the ministry of the gospel. You shared in my struggles in the same way of the gospel ministry. And you did it at that time in harmony. These two women are important to Paul. Rather than disparage them, what is he doing? He's commending them. He's commending them. He corrects them, rebukes them in a sense by virtue of their disagreement. But right on the heels of that, commends them for what? Their faithful service alongside him for the gospel. This disharmony could have a negative effect on the whole church. In regards to Clement, some have speculated. We, this is the only place, by the way, he is mentioned in Scripture. Now, if you were to rely on Origen, one of the old, early church fathers, which in some things you have to be very careful, he claims, Origen claims, that this Clement became one of the bishops at Rome. We have no, that's just merely ridiculous stuff that war, or we have no reason to believe that at all. There's no proof of that, nor is it given to us. In our, Paul doesn't say anything except that this is a man who you ministered beside along with me. And then the close of verse 3 as I wrap it up. Having stressed the importance of unity and harmony among believers in the church, Paul makes it clear that these precious saints, these two ladies, Clement, and not only them, but all his fellow workers are truly Christians. How do we know that he considers them to be truly brothers and sisters in Christ? Because he points to the reality in the close of this verse that their names are where? Their names are written. Their names are in the book of life. I got news for you. Unregenerate names are not written there. In fact, he may not have named them all, the fellow workers by name, but he knew that God knew their names.
and that God had not only, not only was Euodia's and Syntyche and Clement's name written in the book of life along with his, but so were many other workers for the sake of the gospel. Their names are recorded in God's heavenly registry. The names of all the redeemed, chosen in Him before the foundation of the earth are recorded right there. Isn't it amazing? I don't want to digress too much here. How today we've twisted that whole concept of, of somehow the name is written when we come to faith in Christ. When the scriptures say exactly the opposite. When were those names written in the book of life? Before the foundation of the world. Those whom God, in His sovereign love, chose before the foundation of the world to be His, those names are recorded in the book of life. Their names are written there in eternity past, in this book of what we might call eternal life. So while Paul began with a, a rebuke, Paul finishes with a profound commendation, doesn't he? You've got a disagreement, work it out. Someone's going to help you, but don't, remember, but don't forget, we serve together in the struggles of the gospel, and our names are written where? in the registry of heaven. Let's stand. Lord, in this, in this beautiful letter, Paul has expressed so many rich commendations he has spoken so openly and freely about the great joy that these precious believers have brought Him. He has commended them for their continued obedience to the faith, their devotion and dedication to the gospel. He's commended them for remaining firm in the midst of persecution and in the midst of great suffering, He has commended them in so many areas, in so many ways. And yet He, at the close of this letter, as He begins to bring this to a close, stands to remind them of the potential that we as believers face, if we are not careful, of disharmony and disunity to, to break that which we enjoy as we come together as fellow believers in Christ. That we should be quick to address our disagreements, to reconcile our differences, to restore our relationships in such a manner that, Father, we do not in any way, shape, form, or fashion bring reproach upon the church, reproach upon the name of Christ, and that we would in any way weaken our effectiveness to witness for the power of the gospel in a world that so desperately needs to not only hear the gospel, but see our true love and devotion, not only to you, but to one another. So Father, thank you for teaching us this morning through your word. Might we take it to heart, might we guard our heart, May we look after our hearts with all vigilance and all diligence, protecting ourselves from even these small things that can potentially, if we are not careful, become large things and break the unity and harmony we, joy, we enjoy as a church of Jesus Christ. Bless us, I pray this morning, as we sing and as we leave together and as we enjoy our meal together next door. I pray in Christ's name, amen.